This conference will now be recorded. And Brooks, we'll go ahead and hand things over to you. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, I hope I'm not on mute. Can you no, hear me? No, you're not on mute. Yep, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, this talk is very similar to this article, which uh, appeared in the January issue of QP. And um, so not only is there a recording, but you can go to this article and see most of the points I made. There's a little development beyond that. I see the uh, essence of quality as the application of science to business. I believe that's what Deming did. He was a scientist and he did, he did what made sense from a scientific point of view. And he, he developed a set of uh, profound knowledge, areas of knowledge that he thought were essential to, to management. Uh, this included the theory of knowledge, which not too many people like uh, and don't spend a lot of time on, but it's, it's necessary if you're a scientist. Uh, the theory of systems, which is very important. Laws of variation, which originally were the concentration area. Um, there was more about variation than anything else in, in quality. And psychology, which I put in big letters. Um, I had the occasion to attend about six of Deming's uh, four-day seminars toward the end of his life. And in the first one, probably 50% of the time was spent on variation. And as, as things evolved, he began to spend more and more time on psychology to the point that in the last uh, two or three seminars, uh, he had an evening session that was, uh, that was um, not, uh, it was optional. He would attend and sit in the audience and he had a psychologist chair the session and the session was on the psychology of change. So he, he I believe realized that um, the other principles here were fairly simple, but the problem with quality was to get people to adopt the, the methodology. Um, it required change and uh, it was very difficult to, to establish. So he, he became interested in psychology. Uh, in fact, the first seminar I went to, he, he found there were six PhDs in psychology in the room and he called us up at a break and said, what do you think of this? I was not prepared for that. Um, now, now, the psychology that was available to Dr. Deming in the 20th century was pretty much behaviorism. Uh, this is not an employee, uh, but this is, this is where much of the laws of psychology at that time came from. Uh, it's a He's a very smart rat. He's, he knows how to press the lever. And this is the other part of psychology, uh, psychotherapy, treating people with uh, psychological disorders, uh, usually laying down. Now, psychology has changed dramatically in the 21st century. Uh, I can't as a psychologist, it's, it's chilling to me how far psychology has come. Uh, this is a picture of Danny Kahneman receiving the Nobel Prize. He was the first psychologist to receive a Nobel. Uh, I'm not sure which of these guys is Danny because they look alike. <laughs> I believe Kahneman is on the left, but I'm not absolutely sure. And... Uh, Kahneman received this prize for his work in cognitive psychology um, and particularly in decision making. Uh, he received the prize in economics because there was no prize in psychology. 
And Kahneman's work really revolutionized the field of, of economics and created uh, uh, an important field called behavioral economics. Uh, he showed that uh, people didn't behave the way economists thought they should and discovered a lot of biases in decision making. Uh, I recommend his book uh, highly. Uh, it's called Thinking Fast and Slow. And it's, it's a terrific book. And there's a book by Michael Lewis uh, on the same topic. Uh, the name slips my mind now, but it's, it's on Kahneman's life. And it's it's a, an easier book to read, and it's it's a good it's a good book. This is the other development in psychology that's very important. It's a picture of Marty Seligman. Uh, I was a graduate student with Marty uh, back in the uh, late '60s, and Marty did a lot of things in psychology, but the most important thing he did was to invent or popularize positive psychology. And that has become a, a very, very important part of psychology. It's, it, it, there are thousands of people in it. Marty mobilized an army of researchers. He, he says that he was not the first uh, psychologist to recognize the importance of positive uh, processes like like positive affect, happiness, but he was the first to produce a lot of data. And uh, it's, it's an important scientific enterprise that Marty is, is engaged. And we're gonna talk about the effects of Marty's, uh, Marty's science on the quality field. Positive psychology talks about positive subjective experience, positive traits, hope, wisdom, creativity, future mindedness, courage, spirituality, responsibility, and perseverance. The object is to prevent pathology rather than treat it. And it's rather than directed at sick people, it's, it's directed at increasing well being and life satisfaction in healthy people. Now, I believe some great leaders have understood this for a long time, not from a scientific point of view, but from an intuitive point of view. This is one of my favorite leaders, and it's an excellent picture of him. Uh, I like to see that picture, although the $1 bill has become uh, rather small <laughs> in, in, in my lifetime. Uh, this is a letter that uh, George Washington co commissioned to be written to the captains at Valley Forge uh, during the winter that they that that his army spent there, and uh, it was actually prepared by uh, Colonel von Steuben, who was uh, Washington's chief of staff, but it was Washington's initiative and his concept that was carried. This was given to me by a uh, German executive that I met at a conference about a year ago, and I, I found it astonishing. And uh, I, I looked at, I, I made sure it was, it was uh, real. It's not well, it's not circulated very much, but it, it is a real letter. And I'm going to have uh, Norval read it because I'm not a good reader and I don't have a great voice and Norval does. So I think we should listen to this. Well, thank you, Brooks. Uh, I'll go ahead and read it here. Uh, a captain cannot be too careful of the company the state has committed to his charge. He must pay the greatest attention to the health of his men, their discipline, arms, accoutrements, uh, ammunition, clothes, and, and necessaries. His first object should be to gain the love of his men by treating them with every possible kindness and humanity, inquiring into their complaints, and when well-founded, seeing them redressed. He should know every man of his company by name and character. He should often visit those who are sick, speak tenderly to them, 
see that the public provision, whether of medicine or diet, is duly administered and procure them besides such comforts and conveniences as are in his power. The attachment that arises from this kind of attention to the sick and wounded is almost inconceivable. It will more, moreover be the means of preserving the lives of many valuable men. I found it surprising. Uh, and I, I suspect you, you did too. Now, unfortunately, uh, the trend in American business in the last hundred and uh, well, last uh, I'm trying to count out how many years it is uh, 100, about 120 years comes from a man named Charles Taylor who wrote a book called Scientific Management I think it was published in 1911 and this is a statement from Taylor. Hardly a competent workman can be found who does not devote a considerable amount of time to studying just how slowly he can work and still convince his employer that he's going at a good pace. Um, this is not the statement of someone who wants to gain the love of his men. Um, and I, I, I did some research to find out the context that Taylor created this in. It turns out he was working in the iron and steel industry. And at the time that he was there, uh, it was a rather dangerous industry. In fact, the rate of fatalities in that industry was between two and three per hundred workers per year. So any sensible worker would work as slow as he could in that industry. Uh, if you worked at all, um, but that that was Taylor's impression of of, uh, of workers. So his his principles of management were basically the brains are in the managers. Uh, they select the best person to do a job. They train the person in the proper method. And they apply economic incentives to get him to do the job because he, otherwise he wouldn't do it. Uh, it's, it's that simple. Uh, he, he believed in piecework. Deming, Deming, Deming uh, is horrified at piecework and he used to talk about it in his seminars at, at, as a, a terrible thing to do to, to men. Uh, but this is, this is Taylor's theory. Now, I'm, I'm sure that this is still applied and I had experience with it being applied. In 1960, I had graduated from high school and was on my way to college and I got a summer job. Uh, I, wasn't, uh, I wasn't a spokesperson uh, showing a, a Falcon Ford. I was working in a Ford plant. My father had been a Ford executive and uh, so I got a, a, a job which paid very well. Uh, <laughs> I was making 255 an hour, uh, which in 1960 was a lot of money for a kid. And uh, we were making uh, Falcons. Now, my father had, having been an executive, I expected the workers to be a bunch of bums and the kind of people Taylor described. And what I discovered was that was not the case at all. They were, the workers were, were very sad because the quality of the cars we were making was terrible. And they, they would talk continuously about places they had worked where they made good product, uh, this product they hated. And I had a, I had a variety of jobs. <laughs> The, the last job I had was chamois off cars after they were water tested. No car ever passed the water test. They, they all required repairs. But at the end of the model year, they stopped water testing and just shipped the cars. So if you want something at the end of a model year, uh, you, you're in trouble. Uh, the attitude toward workers was pretty scary. Uh, the managers never talked to workers. Uh, as foreman, I, I probably had 
10 minutes of conversation with uh, with my foreman and all the time I was there. And it was just to assign me to jobs. And the really scary people were the supervisors who rode around in golf carts and you didn't want to be around a supervisor. My sound didn't work, but uh, you, you, I, I had some Italian uh, spaghetti Western music to play with the supervisor, but it didn't work. Um, you, you didn't want to encounter a supervisor ever. Now, when Ford was transformed by Deming, uh, the most important thing they did, I believe, was to change the relationship between managers and workers. Uh, Ed Baker uh, was the uh, director of quality at Ford at the time that I was going to Deming seminars, and he was uh, probably the closest person to Deming. Uh, in fact, he wrote. He, he recently wrote a book um, on Deming, which is an excellent book. I reviewed it in uh, uh, the Journal for Quality and Participation. I strongly recommend it. Uh, it's called The Symphony of Profound Knowledge. Ed, told, Ed, Ed was a psychologist, by the way. Um, and Ed told me that the thing he was most proud of at Ford was the relationship between hourly workers and management. He said you could go in a class and see them working side by side in the classroom. Now, uh, Donald Peterson, uh, who was, I believe, the chairman of Ford during that uh, transformation period, wrote a book uh, about the process. And he said that uh, when he visited a plant, the one thing a plant manager could get in trouble for and, and lose, lose her job for was if they didn't know the employees. He would tour the plant and make sure that the uh, plant manager knew all the employees. So this was a people transformation and a relationship transformation more than a technology transformation. So how does happiness influence job performance? Was, was George Washington on the right track? Well, well there's a study looking at uh, job satisfaction of employees in the 100 best companies to work for. This is a list compiled by Fortune every year. And it's, it's pretty seriously done. It's based on a lot of surveys of employees. And Alex Edmonds studied the stock price of these companies, and he concluded firms with high levels of employee satisfaction generate superior long-term, long-horizon returns, even when controlling for industry factor risk and a broad set of other characteristics. The one thing that's weak about this is that it's a correlational study, so you can't really guarantee cause and effect. Uh, you might be happier because your company was called a, one, one of the 100 best companies to work for. Um, and that might influence your, your emotional satisfaction. Um, I'm inclined to think that it's the other way around, but this doesn't prove it. But our own data, uh, I'll try to explain this. Uh, is pretty strongly in, in the direction of cause and effect. Uh, with a partner, uh, Pat Reagan, uh, who's a client for about 25 years, we developed a survey, uh, an employee survey to uh, understand safety performance. And all the questions on this survey are validated, meaning that uh, the, the scores of um, companies with good records are higher than the scores of companies with bad records. Uh, here are four questions from that survey that uh, predict both safety performance and actually uh, overall business performance. Uh, I'm confident of the organization's future success. Employees trust the information that management provides. 
and managers and supervisors treat subordinates with respect. Now, none of these questions ask anything about safety, but all of them correlate with, with safety very strongly. And these are all questions that would relate to employee satisfaction. So I'm convinced that it's cause and effect. Now, now here are the things, things that drive employee satisfaction. Um, you can read them because what I'm going to ask you to do is, is choose the top two and put them in the chat box. Uh, and Norval will, will compile them uh, with as many people. It'll take them a little bit of time. But I'll be interested in seeing what you choose. Just put the number down, like if, if you're going to choose uh, opportunities for advancement, just put down a three. Norval, if you watch the chat box and tell me when you've got a lot of data. Okay, it looks like we've gotten quite a few. It looks like uh, seven, nine, and ten are favorites. Seven, nine, and ten. Well, I'm going to show you the top two, and they they account for fifty percent of the variance. They're they're much stronger. I'm going to show you the top three actually. Social relationships on the job, and the most important relationship is the one you have with your supervisor. Interesting job is second and pay is third. And this is a big effect. So this is this this group answered very differently. It could be uh, there, there's a lot of possible reasons. This is not a uh, uh, these groups are very high level compared to who's being surveyed. Uh, in the data that I'm presenting. What relationship with your supervisor or manager is, is number one, and interesting work is number two. Back to our data and uh, back to uh, George Washington. Okay. Now, I'm going to ask you to do something else. Um, this, is, this is a way of introducing a study that uh, bears on this issue. But I'm going to ask you what word fits with these three words. Somebody put in their chat box. Okay. Yeah, a lot of people got that one. Uh, it's cheese. And so you get cottage cheese, Swiss cheese, and cheesecake. That's an easy one. I'm going to give you two more. One is a hard one, and one is not soluble. And I don't expect you to solve it. I expect you to answer quickly which one is soluble um, without solving it. If you solve it, don't put anything down. Um, but before you solve it, take your intuition and answer by the letter. So A is dive light rocket and B is dream ball book. And put your answers in right now. A or B.
Which one is soluble? Put your answer down now. Don't take a bunch of time. How many have we got? Normal. Looks like the majority uh, folks chose uh, choice B. It's interesting. Uh, the correct one is A, skydive, skylight, and skyrocket. Um, what's interesting is I did this in uh, a group uh, two weeks ago, and uh, the vast majority chose A. Um, This is insight, and the people who designed this study call it call this an index of insight. And here's some data. Uh, this is this this is the proportion of people who chose the right one, and the proportion of people who chose the wrong one. So, and it's significant. Uh, it's a significant difference. And here's the interesting manipulation. They made an emotional um, manipulation. So some of the people were asked to think of a, a, a sad event in their life for, for a period of time. And others were asked to think of a positive event in, in their life. And the people who thought of a positive event had a much higher percentage of correct choices and the people who thought of a negative event, um, the, the difference was no longer significant. Um, they, they couldn't do the task at all. And insight is pretty important in, in work. It, it's the core of creativity. In fact, the, uh, the test I gave you, uh, the remote association test uh, is used in most tests of creativity. Uh, in safety, it's pretty important because um, you can intuit something's, gonna, something's going wrong before you know what it is. Uh, so happy people have much better intuition than unhappy people. Now, the manipulation is a little bit artificial, uh, but the data are pretty clear. How is insight useful in business? Very useful. Now, positive psychology is extremely powerful. And the psychology that I grew up with uh, was not. In 2008, the Army Chief of Staff, General Casey, called Seligman to his office. And he said, when Seligman got there, all his books were on the table. Everybody had done a bunch of study uh, and uh, were very familiar with his work. And Casey told Seligman that we had a lot of problems with returning troops, PTSD, divorce, depression, and drug abuse. And he, asked, he asked Marty what positive psychology could do about this. Seligman suggested resilience training, which he was already doing with civilians, and suggested a pilot study. Casey said, hell no. <laughs> we're, we're in a war, and we need a complete program. And they, the Army arranged 
a $30 million no bid contract with the University of Pennsylvania because they were the only persons with the capability of doing this to train trainers to then train the troops in, in resilience training. And they trained as of when Seligman wrote this book in 2018, they had trained 40,000 sergeants in resilience training. Returning troops who received this training had significantly less PS, PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome, and less than half the rate of drug abuse compared to soldiers that did not receive the training. That's, that's a huge effect, billions of dollars saved, and more than that, a tremendous amount of human suffering saved from some simple training. Now in World War II, not, the psychology of the 20th century, uh, their war contribution was that Skinner trained pigeons to guide missiles, but it turned out that, that if they were actually in a missile, they couldn't guide it very well. So that project was scrapped. So no pigeons became war heroes. Here's another example of the power. Sullivan designed a 14 week treatment for depression using positive psychology methods. One of the prominent methods, and this is how simple some positive psychology is, is called the three blessings. Every night before you go to bed, you write down three things that went well that day, and then why. And you do that for two weeks or a month. Match control groups were treated with conventional therapy or conventional therapy plus drugs. 55% of Seligman's patients achieve remission. 20% with conventional therapy. And this is amazing, 8% 8, 8 with therapy plus drugs. The drugs actually uh, make it worse. Um, Seligman t submitted two grant proposals to follow up this study uh, because this was a small study. They were turned down. And he believes it's the power of the pharmaceutical companies who would be very embarrassed with these data and the uh, therapists, the psych psychiatrists particularly have a pretty strong lobby. Um, which Seligman has fought all his life. Um, fortunately, uh, Seligman gets a lot of money from private sources, uh, millions of dollars in grant money uh, from private sources, so he doesn't have to depend on politics. Now, as a quality person, what should you do? Well, one thing I recommend is you, you read a few of Seligman's books and learn more about positive psychology because that's that's where psychology is right now. And that's that's the technology that's powerful. It's important to measure employee satisfaction. Uh, my QP article explains where you can find free scales to do that. And if it's low, uh, you need to deal with that before you're going to do anything else in a quality program. You're not going to get people to change. I'm currently in the process of preparing a paper on positive psychology and organizational change. It should appear in the April issue of QP. And I believe that the quality field is missing the boat by not having more emphasis on, on psychology. Um, it's, it's at the heart of the problems of uh, adopting quality. And there is powerful technology available and it's not being accessed. And my, my mission is to convince people that it's important and useful and get 
the quality field to begin to take advantage of, of the power of psychology. So with that, uh, I'm sure people have questions or comments and thank you for your attention. And I hope I've made my case a little bit. Thank you, Brooks. Uh, folks, if you do have questions, uh, please uh, put them into the chat box now. Uh, we can uh, pause here for a few seconds as you do that. Okay, Brooks, the first question is from Emily. Uh, how do you get the company to address the employee satisfaction level when there are issues? Well, I, have to, I think you have to convince them that employee satisfaction uh, drives performance. Okay, uh, next question uh, from Susan is, any studies quantify the impact of happiness or satisfaction on productivity and profitability? And if so, how much impact? How much impact is hard to say. Uh, our data says it's a lot. Uh, it's a big effect. Um, it would be hard to quantify because there's other variety of work situations. Um, but it's, th there's a lot of work. There are a lot of studies that show the impact. Okay, we're going to move on to the next question from Saraf. Uh, how do you relate Maslow's needs or higher Shea and Frederick Herzberg's two-factor theories into this discussion? Well, I, Seligman mentions Maslow, and the difference between Maslow and Seligman is that Maslow didn't produce much data. Uh, but there were a number of people who recognized the importance of positive emotions uh, early on, but but they they didn't do they didn't they didn't collect data. Okay, the next question is from Shan Shanley. I hope I pronounced your first name correctly. Uh, can you please let us know the name of the book that you were referring on psychology? Um, Thinking Fast and Slow, Kahneman's book. And uh, uh, Michael Lewis's book is, I think it's called The Undoing Factor. Why he called it that, I don't know. It's a terrific book. Uh, Seligman's book, uh, Flourish, uh, is very good. Okay, the next question is from Savitri. Uh, once again, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, does employee satisfaction play a role in right-to-work states? I, I, could you repeat that? Oh, sorry. Uh, does employee satisfaction play a role in right to work states? I can't, I can't quite understand. I wonder if there's a word missing, like maybe how does employee satisfaction play a role in right to work states? 
in, in play a role in what? Right to work states. W wife? No, right to work states. Oh, oh, right to work states. Yes. Well, I can't answer that. <laughs> Okay. An interesting uh, question. But yeah, it was. Okay. Uh, next one, we'll move on uh, to Emily. Uh, what is the most effective data to cite to make the argument for a need for change? Well, I think that's situational. Uh, falling behind the competition <laughs> would be would be. Uh, uh, I, I think economic problems are always uh, at the forefront. Um, now, if you're smart and you can detect um, decreases in employee morale, that would be a signal to do something before you find economic problems. But um, ultimately, it's economic difficulties, I think. OK. Uh, let's see, a uh, comment from Gary. Uh, this seems analogous to ergonomics programs in the workplace. Management must be shown how spending the resources will improve the bottom line. Uh, Payush's uh, question, uh, is there a fine line between keeping employees happy and satisfying employees with high unreasonable demands and how to walk that fine line? A line between happy employees and what? And satisfying employees who have high unreasonable demands. Oh, well. Most won't is what I would say, and uh, the pro one problem is is that um, a lot of managers have that have the set point that any demand is unreasonable. You're getting paid; you should like it. Um, so I, I think you need to educate management about people and um, there will always be somebody who will make unreasonable demands, but most people won't. And uh, as long as you're not biased to, against employees, you can, you can make decisions about this. Um, but a lot of managers um, are believe that employees shouldn't, shouldn't complain and, uh, see any demand is unreasonable. Re read Dilbert. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The next uh, question we have is from Major. Uh, we we always we have always heard that hourly workers pay much attention to their paychecks. How can we as management? take some quick actions to help improve the situation? Well, I, I can tell you that the work, the hourly workers I worked with um, were more concerned about the quality of the vehicles. They, they didn't complain about their pay. They might now, times have changed. Uh, in those days, they could support a family on what they made in a Ford plant. Actually, they probably could today, but there are not many jobs like that. But um, um, I, I think that uh, pay was third on that list of employee satisfaction. Uh, I, I think that the social relationships at work are really important and um, the quality of the work they're doing. Okay. 
If you're making okay. lives better for other people, that's worth a few bucks. Okay, we're going to go ahead and move on to the next one uh, from Ola. How do you relate with a supervisor who may set you up for failure sometimes? Um, I can't. I can't solve that problem for you. Uh, I, I don't have a good solution. If you have a bad supervisor, you probably should uh, should look for another job. That's what people do. Uh, having a bad supervisor is uh, increases turnover by a lot. Okay, and a couple of comments uh, from folks here related to um, talk and the article in Quality Progress. Okay, let's see if we have anything else here. Oh, uh, Chris Christina uh, has a question. Uh, how do you stay positive when you deal with a manager that is not supportive and egotistic? I don't think you can cure that from the subordinate position. Uh, I think you look for another job. Okay. Uh, Sarath has another question. Uh, how do you relate job satisfaction to Frederick Herzberg's two-factor theory? I don't know Frederick Herzberg's two-factor theory, so I can't. Okay. Any other questions? That was the last one that I see in the chat box. Uh, any any final comments, Brooks? No good questions. Very much so. Okay, uh, does not look like there are any other questions coming. Um, so uh, before we wrap things up here, uh, gonna go ahead and rem make a, another reminder here that uh, oh, another question just did come up. Okay, uh, which books did you recommend? What, what were the names of the books once more? Okay, one is by Kahneman called Thinking Fast and Slow. That's complicated, but very good. Um, another one by Michael Lewis. Uh, he's the guy who wrote Moneyball. Um, I think it's called The Undoing Project. And uh, a third one is a book by Seligman uh, called Flourish. And you can go way back to uh, the early days, Seligman wrote a book called Authentic Happiness, uh, which is which is good. And uh, then he wrote an autobiography uh, called The Hope Circuit, which came out uh, this year or last year, 2018. Okay. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and remind everybody that our next webinar uh, will be a week from tomorrow. It'll be on February 14th, uh, Thursday, which is Valentine's Day. Uh, Stemaic and Autism, a Sample Size of One with J.D. Marhevko, uh, who is Senior Vice President of Quality, Lean and EHS for Accurite Corporation. Uh, we've had quite a few people register for that one, as well as the uh, webinar on the 21st, uh, but there's plenty of space still available. So if you haven't registered yet, uh, you still have time to do so. Um, we're going to go ahead and, and wrap things up today. Don't see any other questions coming through. So uh, we'd like to thank uh, Brooks Carter once again for presenting for us today. Thank you, Brooks.
And thank also you. like to, and I'd also like to uh, thank all of you uh, for joining us uh, today. And uh, until uh, a week from tomorrow, the 14th, uh, we hope to see you then. Uh, until then, uh, we wish everybody a great rest of the day. Thanks again. Bye now. Thank you.